So in this third part of the lecture, we are going to look at new relation. The focus is on what we call the notochord, the neural tube. In the process, we'll also talk about neural tube defects and something called neural crest. Neurulation is the process of formation of the neural tube. The neural tube is the primordium of the central nervous system. When you talk of the central nervous system, we are referring to the brain and the spinal cord. So the neural tube forms the brain and the spinal cord. This process of neurulation takes place starting from the third week of development, but it continues into the fourth week of development. Usually it begins at around the 17th day after conception and day 17 is within the third week of development. So just after the primitive streak has formed and gastrulation has just taken place, then neurulation begins. We have two types of neurulation, the primary neurulation and secondary neurulation. So in this lecture, we are going to look at how the notochord forms. We are also going to see its functions and its fate. After that, we are going to talk about the two processes of neurulation, which means both primary neurulation and secondary neurulation. We will then talk about the derivatives of neurotube and neurocrest. Maybe I've already told you the derivatives of the neurotube as being the brain and the spinal cord, but the others that I'll mention. Neurocrest derivatives are so many, we'll also talk about them. Last but not least, we'll also talk about what we call neural tube defects. So we'll define what they are, and I'll give you a few examples. Let's start by talking about the notochord. The notochord is a special type of cartilage. It's a cartilaginous structure, or almost like cartilage in terms of histology. That structure lies within the mesoderm, cranial to the primitive node. Now I want you to understand that well. This black structure here represents the notochord. But the notochord does not form in the whole of the embryo. Now, you don't know this is a sagittal section of the trilaminar embryo with ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. This ectoderm here represents the region where the primitive streak was because the primitive streak is on the caudal end. So let's assume the primitive streak was here up to there where we now have the primitive pit. From that primitive pit, that's where we have the notochord. Now, importantly, we can see that while the primitive streak was on the epiblast, which became ectoderm, the notochord is within the mesoderm layer. In cross-section, it will appear like this. This is the notochord. It is within the mesoderm layer in the middle, but cranial to the primitive streak. You realize, therefore, that the notochord is within the gastrula, not the bilaminar embryo. It is within the gastrula. So it's a special type of cartilage. I'll not go into the mechanisms of its formation. I don't think it's really necessary for our level of learning, but at least the presence of the notochord is an important thing. So if you look at it from above, we'll expect the primitive streak to be there. Then at the, from the end of the primitive streak, we have the notochord, but it's lying within the mesoderm layer. 
what are the functions of the NOTO code? The NOTO code provides structural support to the embryo, in this case, the gastrula. The same way the primitive streak was providing structural support to the bilaminar embryo. The NOTO code, just like the primitive streak, also defines the embryonic axis. We now know that this is the center, this is the right, this is the left side. This is the cranial end, this is the caudal end. So the axis is defined by the NOTO code as well as the primitive streak. <clears throat> the NOTO code forms the basis of formation of the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton form around the NOTO code. So wherever the notochord is, that's where the axial skeleton will be, be. And remember the axial skeleton include the cranium, the vertebral column, and the ribs. So the, it forms the basis of the axial skeleton. I'm not saying it becomes the axial skeleton. It forms the basis of the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton form around it. That's why we are seeing the scleroth the the somites which become the sclerotome around the notochord here. Last but not least, the notochord induces the process of primary neurulation. It induces the process of primary neurulation. Those are the functions of the notochord. What's the fate of the notochord? Once the notochord has served its functions, the notochord will disappear. Although it disappears, not all parts of the notochord disappear and this is normal. There are some parts of the notochord that don't disappear. The parts of the notochord that don't disappear become incorporated within the developing intervertebral disc, and that becomes the nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc. That's why I told you that nucleus pulposus of the intervertebral disc do not come from the sclerotome. They come from the notochord, the remnants of the notochord. So this is the fate of the notochord. A big part disappears. Some small parts become incorporated into the developing intervertebral disc, the center of it being called the nucleus pulposus. So this image shows you the central part of the intervertebral disc, which is called the nucleus pulposus, which come from the notochord. It's a mucus tissue. The others, the annulus fibrosus, the outer part of the intervertebral disc, together with the vertebra, those ones come from the sclerotome, which is a derivative of the somite, which is a derivative of the paraxial mesoderm. What about if the parts of the notochord which are supposed to disappear don't disappear? What happens? Same concept, if embryonic tissues that are supposed to disappear, don't disappear, then they can develop into a tumor. The tumors which arise from remnants of the notochord are called chordomas. We don't call them teratomas. The notochord does not have the potential of becoming multiple tissues. We call them chordomas. These are tumors arising from remnants of the notochord. They are common in the bacilla part of the cranium, the bacilla bone, that this is the region of the codomas. They can also be common in the sacral region. As you can see, this is the codoma. There's a tumor on the sacrum of the, this, this, this is actually almost an adult, even this one. Those are codomas, tumors. They tend to be, they'll definitely be midline. They'll be expected to be midline. Right. I've talked about notochord. Now I want to talk about neurulation. I've told you that there are two types of neurulation, primary neurulation and secondary neurulation. Primary neurulation is responsible for formation of the neurotube on the upper part of the embryo. The cranial parts of the neurotube form from primary neurulation. I've told you that neurulation is a process of formation of the neurotube. So the cranial neurotube form from primary neurulation. The lower part of the neurotube form from secondary neurulation. Let's see the process of primary neurulation. Now look at this image first. This is the embryo, trilamina at this stage. So this is where the primitive streak was. That means that this is the caudal end of the embryo. 
So from the primitive streak, at this point, we have the primitive node and the primitive pit, and from there, we have the notal code going cranially. We expect the neural tube to be covering the whole of the embryo, or at least major part of the embryo. So the mechanism of formation of the neural tube on this cranial end is through primary neurulation. Remember, the cranial end is the region that has an autocode. The mechanism of formation of the neural tube on this caudal end will be through secondary neurulation. Remember, the caudal end does not have an autocode, but it has a primitive streak, or it was having a primitive streak. So the new neural tube that forms on this caudal end will form from secondary neurulation. The neural tube that forms from this side will form from primary neurulation. Let's begin by talking about the primary neurulation process. Primary neurulation process. Look at this image and let's follow. So let's take this blue to be the ectoderm and this thin line to be the endoderm. And so these dotted things to be the mesoderm and that black one, the notochord. So we are taking a section through the embryo on the cranial side where the notochord is present, right? The notochord induces the overlying ectoderm the ectoderm within the influence of the notochord is induced so that it differentiates into what we had called earlier the neuroectoderm. So remember, this notochord is inducing the overlying ectoderm so that the region of the ectoderm within the molecular influence of the notochord become neuroectoderm. The rest of the ectoderm is known as surface ectoderm. That's the first step. After induction by the notochord, the region we have called the neuroectoderm then undergo thickening. The neuroectoderm cells grow faster than the surface ectoderm. So this region here, they undergo thickening because of proliferation. And that thickening of the neuroectoderm is known as the neural plate. So this structure from there up to there is what we call the neural plate. The neural plate then undergo folding. The neural plate folds on itself like this, as you can see here, that neural plate, the thickened part folds as we can see here. And maybe the next image would be better to show that folding. This is the neural plate that has folded. Now let's name some parts of this fold. This central part is called the neural groove. The depressed part is called the neural groove. The edges of the groove are known as the neural folds. These edges, they are known as the neural folds. The neural folds are also called the neural crests. So you can call them the neural folds or the neural crests. This is the neural groove. These are the neural folds, which are also called the neural crests. Now, as development continues, the two folds, this one and this one, come together. They come together so that they fuse to form a complete tube, which we call the neural tube. <clears throat> when that fusion takes place, not all the cells which were in the plate become incorporated into the tube. Some cells which were in the plate, which later became the crests, uh, these regions, are not incorporated into the tube. And those cells which are not incorporated into the tube, they are cells of the neural crest. We still call them the neural crest cells. 
So the neural crest cells are not incorporated into the tube. These are the neural crest cells. The cells which are not incorporated into the neural tube constitute the neural crest cells. So at the end of primary neurulation, we have a neural tube and neural crest. They are all from the neuroectoderm. So this image shows you what you've said again in different words that we have notochord inducing overlying ectoderm to thick so that it becomes a neuroectoderm. The neuroectoderm is this central zone and the surface ectoderm is the peripheral part. Remember surface ectoderm gives you the epidermis of the skin. The neuroectoderm gives you the nervous system. The neuroectoderm thickens to become the neuroplate and that neuroplate falls so that we have a neural fall, neural groove and neural falls. So the groove is at the center, the falls are in the edges there. We've called them neural falls or neural crests. Then the falls fuse so that we form a neural tube and neural crest, which are not in this image, but it is in this other image here. This is the groove, these are the falls of the crest. As the fusion occurs, you have neural crest cells being there and the neural tube there. This is surface ectoderm. Good, that is primary neurulation. The primary neural tube is the neural tube that is formed from primary neurulation. You understand that if you have a tube, then you can have two openings. The anterior opening is called the cranial neuropore. This is the cranial neuropore. The cranial neuropore closes on the 25th day after conception. After conception. The other opening is called the caudal neuropore and the caudal neuropore closes three days later. So this is the neurotube that is closing down and now it has closed down. So this is the cranial neuropore, this is the caudal neuropore. Now these things you are seeing here as cubes on either side, those are the somites, which are also forming. Things are happening at the same time. Great, that is primary neurulation and the primary neural tube. Now let's talk about secondary neurulation. Secondary neurulation does not occur by induction of the notochord because the notochord is not present caudally. Secondary neurulation occurs by mesenchymal condensation. Mesenchyme is embryonic connective tissue commonly derived from mesoderm. So mesodermal condensation. So this secondary neurulation involves formation of the neural tube on the caudal end, the regions that don't have a neural plate because there's no notochord to induce the ectoderm to become a neural plate. So if you remember this image, on the cranial end, there's a notochord. And so the neurulation from here will occur through primary neurulation, where you have a notochord inducing ectoderm to become neural plate that will then fall on itself. But on this region here, we don't have a notochord. So we don't have a neural plate. Therefore, the neural tube on this side will form from secondary neurulation. If you take a cross section through here, perhaps this is what you're going to see. Ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, there's no notochord. So how do we form neural tube here? What happened here is that the mesoderm at the center here is the one that undergoes condensation. So that is mesodermal or mesenchymal condensation. Mesenchyme is embryonic connective tissue usually derived from mesoderm. So if I use the term mesenchyme and mesoderm, we can use them at least at this point interchangeably. Mesenchyme condenses. So this has shown you mesenchyme that has condensed. If you look at this from a longitudinal perspective, it will be like a long road. Some people call the neural road, neural road. That neural road then undergoes cavitation as we can see here. There's a cavity that appears at the center of the road. So condensation 
which form neural rod, and then cavitation at the center of the rod so that we have this one as a cavitation. Eventually, you have what you call the neural tube. So that's the neural tube. That is secondary neurulation. Great. What happens? We have formed neural tube from primary neurulation, the cranial part of the neural tube. We've also formed the caudal part of the neural tube from secondary neurulation. See, this is the neural tube. The neural tube from primary neurulation joins with the neural tube from secondary neurulation to form the whole neural tube. The junction, okay, let me say this first. What does the neural tube become? The neural tube becomes the central nervous system, which is the brain as well as the spinal cord. The brain and the spinal cord come from the neural tube. The junction between the primary neural tube and the secondary neural tube is somewhere here, actually, corresponding with around the first and the second sacral segment of the spinal cord, S1, S2 segments of the spinal cord. That is the junction between the primary and the secondary neural tube. So just the lower parts of the spinal cord, those distal ends of the spinal cord is what is derived from secondary neural tube. The rest of the central nervous system is derived from the primary neural tube. I now want to talk about, oh, there's a question for you, had forgotten. Remember these questions, I use them to monitor you as well as to take roll call of attendance of class, just in case you've forgotten. All right, so you have a question there. You have, uh, it's a straightforward question, so you have 30 seconds. All right, I believe you're done. So I'm still wondering why people are failing it, but it's okay, it's a choice you made. Actually, I'm surprised that majority have failed it. You have to think through you have to follow the lecture. And especially if you have an online lecture, you have to follow for you to get, otherwise you'll fail. We just mentioned that <coughs> the neural plate is from ectoderm. And that's the one that forms the neural tube. Let's talk about neural tube defects. Neural tube defects are very significant birth defects of the central nervous system. And they occur due to a defect in the neurulation process. So these are problems that take place around the third and the fourth week of development. They may develop when a portion of the neural tube fails to close normally. We've seen how the neural tube should close. So if a portion of the neural tube or a whole the whole neural tube fail to close normally, you get what we call neural tube defects. The resulting malformation may affect multiple organs, not just the central nervous system. It may affect, yes, the spinal cord. It may affect the brain. But apart from that, it may also affect the tissues around there. So think about the tissues around there. For the spinal cord, you are thinking about the vertebral column. You are thinking about the skin. You think about the fat tissue around there. You think about the ligaments around there. It involves multiple tissues around there. The same as if it was affecting the brain, it will also affect the skull and even the scalp can be affected. Now, the risk factors for development of neurotube defects are multiple. 
and commonly the deficiency of folic acid has been ascribed to it but also there's some genetic predispositions to the development of neurotube defects you can want you may want to remember those two at least for your level of learning but there are other associations as well if you remember folic acid deficiency that's okay for me and if you remember genetic predisposition that's okay for me you will go to your second year neurotube defects can be classified as closed neurotube defects if the malformation is covered by intact skin but it can also be called open neurotube defect if there is no skin covering if there's no skin covering the cns may be just covered by a thin membrane which is not skin or sometimes just exposed you see it on the surface those are open neurotube defects very severe forms of central nervous system malformation they may involve the cranium and so those are the ones we call the cranial defects the spinal defects are generally called spinal dysraphism so the neurotube defects that affect the spine are generally called spinal dysraphism these are examples of neurotube defects that involve the cranium the first one is where the brain has not formed we call it anencephaly it occurs as a result of failure of closure of the cranial neuropore failure of closure of the cranial neuropore i told you that the cranial neuropore closes on the 25th day if it fails to close you get an encephaly perhaps the most severe form of cns malformation well there's another one that also looks ugly i'll show you the second one is called encephalocele it's just a cyst this is coming from there's a defect in the skull and also the part of the brain is popping through that we call it encephalocele for the spinal dysraphisms look at these images first you know this is the normal one where the spinal cord is completely enclosed by the vertebral column but then you can have a situation where the vertebral column does not completely enclose the spinal cord like in this case commonly we call this on the spina bifida so you may have a defect of the vertebral column like here there's a defect but there is no swelling we want to call the one, this one spina bifida occulta or occult spinal dysraphism spina bifida occulta is the commonest name we give it when you have spina bifida occulta there is no swelling but there is a dimple there and usually you may have a lot of hair in that region with hyperpigmentation spina bifida occulta commonly occurring on the lumbar sacral region of the baby if there is a swelling then you want to know what is within that swelling but if there's a swelling it will appear like this one if that swelling contain meninges only with csf we call it meningocele but if it contains neuro tissue as well then we call it myelomeningocele so these will be examples of an open neurotube defect open spinal dysraphism great you may have a situation where the neuro tube the neuro plate fail to fuse completely when you have an open neuro plate in a particular small segment it may appear like this we call that rachischisis but it may also affect the whole of the neural axis then we call it cranial rachischisis so add cranial here then this one cranial rachischisis it's affecting both the cranial side and the spine 
you know, rachi refers to the spine, then schisis means open or split. So open spine, rachischisis. So if it is open cranium and spine, then it's cranial rachischisis. Great, as I finish, let's talk about neurocrest derivatives. Now we've talked about neurotube and I've told you neurotube disorders. Neurocrest cells are the cells which do not incorporate themselves into the neurotube. These neurocrest cells have some properties. And I want you to remember two properties of neurocrest. One of them is that they're migratory. The cells of the neurocrest migrate a lot. They go to different parts of the body. Second property of neurocrest is that they are multipotent cells. It means that the potential of forming multiple tissue lines, they're migratory and they're multipotent. So what do the neurocrest cells become? They become many things. To start with, they form some things within the peripheral nervous system. So what is it that they form within the peripheral nervous system? You can list them, there are many. They form the Schwann cells. These are the cells that form the myelin sheath. They form the sensory nerves. So whether it's a cranial nerve or a spinal nerve, those sensory nerves come from neurocrest. The efferent nerves don't come from neurocrest because those ones grow out from the neurotube. You see these ones? These are motor neurons. They grow from the neurotube out. So motor neurons come from the neurotube, but sensory nerves grow into the CNS. So those ones come from neurocrest. Also within the peripheral nervous system, we have sympathetic ganglia. The sympathetic ganglia also come from neurocrest. We are still within the peripheral nervous system. The enteric nervous system also come from neurocrest, the enteric nervous system. That's the nerve plexus within the wall of the GIT. They come from neurocrest. Also, the parasympathetic nerves also come from neurocrest. So those are the neurocrest derivatives within the peripheral nervous system. How about within the skin? What are the neurocrest derivatives within the skin? Neurocrest gives us the melanocytes. Melanocytes are the cells that form the skin pigments. They, become, they come from neurocrest. The melanocytes of the skin come from neurocrest. Also within the skin, we have what we call the Merkel cells. M-E-R-K-E-L, Merkel cells also come from neurocrest. You'll check on the role of Merkel cells. Within the endocrine system, what does neurocrest give us? Neurocrest gives us two things. The chromaffin cells of the adrenomedulla. The chromaffin cells of the adrenomedulla form are, are the cells which secrete adrenaline. So basically the adrenaline secreting cells of the adrenomedulla, they, they come from neural crest. Apart from chromaffin cells of the adrenomedulla, we also have parafollicular cells of thyroid gland. We are still talking about endocrine system. So chromaffin cells of the adrenomedulla and parafollicular cells of thyroid gland. The latter, those parafollicular cells of thyroid gland secrete calcitonin. So calcitonin secreting cells also come from neurocrest. In the craniofacial region, which means this region here, cranium and face, neurocrest gives rise to what? Now listen to this. The neurocrest of the craniofacial region contribute to formation of mesenchyme. Remember mesenchyme is embryonic connective tissue. So neurocrest of the craniofacial region contribute to formation of mesenchyme 
of the head and neck region. This mesenchyme then forms a lot of things. Let's name them. It forms the dummies of the skin of the face. The dummies of the skin of the face is of neuroplast origin. Apart from dummies of the skin of the face, it also contributes to formation of the anterior cranium. So the bones of the anterior cranium are of neurocrest origin. Things like mandible, maxilla, those are neurocrest origin. Apart from that, the neurocrest of the craniofacial region also contribute to formation of the odontoblasts. Odontoblasts are the cells that form teeth. Odontoblasts are the cells that form teeth. They also contribute to formation of the iridal epithelium. This is the epithelium of the iris. Remember that still pigment cells, iridal epithelium, the epithelium of the iris. And lastly, contribute to formation of the skeletal muscles of pharyngeal arc origin. Skeletal muscles of pharyngeal arc origin are of neurocrest origin. That is in the craniofacial region. And lastly, in the heart, neurocrest is important in what we call conotrancal septation. Conotrancal septation. There's something called the conus and the trunk of the heart. So one word, conotrancal septation of the conotrancal structure give rise to formation of the aorta and pulmonary trunk. So for you to divide the aorta and pulmonary trunk into those two chambers, you need involvement of neurocrest. Those are neurocrest derivatives. We will ask you that question until you finish first year. Anomalies of neurocrest. The common malformations associate neurocrest are these ones, but there are many having mentioned that we have different derivatives of neurocrest. We have what you call congenital aganglionic megacolon. Congenital aganglionic megacolon is a condition that occurs when there's no neurocrest migration to the alimentary canal. So therefore, there's a segment of the alimentary canal that lacks neurocrest cells, which means it lacks the enteric nervous system. If a region of the GIT lacks enteric nervous system, that region may not experience peristalsis. In the understanding that the migration is craniocaudal, or rather from the up proximally going distally, if there is deficiency of migration, it will affect the lower parts of the alimentary canal rather than the upper parts. So the parts which are affected are largely the rectum and the colon. Assume a scenario where the colon and the rectum don't have nerves. It means when this child is eating, the food that they have eaten cannot be pushed through those two segments. So what happens? We are calling it a ganglionic to mean that that part does not have nerves, first of all. Lack of ganglions, a ganglionic. Now, if this child is eating, but the food is not moving down, it means that the food will be accumulating on the parts which have the nerves. And so with time, those segments will be uh, dilated. And that's why we're using the term mega colon. So the parts of the colon which are normal will just distend. And so that child will have distension of some parts of the colon. But distal to that distension, the segment that is a ganglionic will not be distended. This is something a child is born with. Congenital aganglionic megacolon is also called Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung is H-I-R-S-C-H. I've lost it. All right, you'll check Hirschsprung's disease. Disorders of skin pigmentation can also be associated with neurocrest and especially what we call vitiligo and albinism. 
you can check on them. This is what we call fast pharyngeal arc syndromes. They also associated with neural crest deficiency in the head and neck region. So on this note, there are two things to check. This is what we call teacher Collins syndrome. Teacher Collins syndrome and Perry Robin syndrome. Teacher Collins syndrome and Perry Robin syndrome. Those are fast act syndromes due to deficiency of neural crest in the head and neck region. I told you that the head and neck region develop from what you call pharyngeal arches. Those pharyngeal arches require neural crest. Some malformations in the heart are also due to neural crest uh, disorders because we need neural crest for some septations within the heart. I don't want to tell you which cardiac malformations are of neural crest uh, basis for now, but understand that there are some malformations in the heart that can be due to neural crest malfunction. Good. So that's what I had for you. I think this is the last question you're doing. As I take the last roll call, I've noted that you people are just leaving the class. But it's okay, we agree it's a choice. So you have that question. I'm giving you one minute, 30 seconds, because it requires your reasoning. All right, your time is up. So this one I can explain to you. This one I don't mind explaining because um, if you don't get it, I'll understand. The others I won't understand. So we've mentioned that uh, folic acid is important in neurodevelopment and especially in neurulation. Therefore, if a woman gives birth to a child with a neurotube defect, one of the things we want to suspect is if there was folic acid deficiency. In that case, we need to supplement folic acid to this woman so that she does not give rise to a child with a neurotube defect again. You may not do anything with the child that she has already given birth to, but for subsequent deliveries, you want to prevent it from happening. So the question is, at what point should we give that folic acid? And the answer should be before she conceives. The reason why you need to give that folic acid before the woman conceives is because you want this folic acid to be there adequately when neurulation process is taking place. If you wait until you know that the woman is pregnant, already neurulation is already taking place because neurulation takes place in the third week, starting from day 17. Now you realize that day 17 from the time of conception, the woman is not even aware that she's already pregnant. Maybe she's just suspecting, ah, my periods have delayed by two days, three days, but she's not made that decision that she's already pregnant yet new relation is already taking place. So you never wait until you establish the pregnancy. That's the point here. Folic acid is supplemented before conception to prevent neurotube defects from occurring. That does not mean that we then, after that, we don't need folic acid. Apart from prevention of neurotube defects, folic acid is still important for the rest of development of the nervous system. And that is why women will still be given folic acid and iron even during their pregnancy period. Great, so that marks the end of the lecture. Thank you very much.